าเสนอเ
I came with the word from the Lord that said the devil's desire was to turn the whole world upside down. The word sift means to cause your faith to be so agitated that it's at the point of overthrow. Am I talking to somebody there? Somebody who's been in the COVID nightmare. Somebody who's been in the financial nightmare. But God told me to tell you, after Jesus prayed for Peter, after Peter's fail, faith did not fail, after Peter was converted, that means his attention was taken from the things of the world to the things of God. The Bible says, Peter, strengthen your brethren. And God told me, if you want to lift people, you yourself have to be strong. You cannot lift people if you are weak. And that's where this came from, from sifted to lifted. I believe that what the devil meant for the worst of times is going to become the best of times. Because there's two kinds of people. It's all about perspective. Your perspective determines your positivity. How you see the situation. You see, I'm looking at this as this is an opportunity for God to display his magnificence in the church. Am I talking to somebody? Like I was sharing on the radio a few days ago, if you read Luke chapter 21, the Bible talks about in the last days, in the last days, rumors of wars, earthquakes, famine, pestilence. Then it says that nations shall rise against nation. The word nation there means the ethnic groups. That's what we are seeing, the racial groups fighting each other. It's all there in Luke 21 and in Matthew 24. But people forget this. The Bible says at the end of Luke 21, he says that, and not one hair of your hair, not one hair of your head will fall to the ground if you take heed to what I'm saying. So just because there's earthquakes, pestilences, famines, doesn't mean that I have to participate. It's all about your reaction. So when there's ethnic war, when there's racial war, when there's genocide, when there's... Um, famines and rumors of war, when there's earthquakes, the question is on what side are you going to be on? Are you going to be those who are afflicted or those who see the abundance? Don't forget, when Israel was coming out of Egypt, the Bible says that the, the Israelites spoiled the Egyptians. Somebody left with gold and silver. Somebody left destroyed, wasted, and spoiled. The question is whose side are you going to be on? At the beginning of the COVID, I spoke to you also and I said, if you look at Malachi chapter 3, verse 15, the Bible says that in that day when God makes up his jewels, that he will, he will differentiate between those who serve him and those who serve him not. So this is a situation that is going to differentiate between the servants of God and those who are not. And we're talking about how you can go from the worst of times to the best of times. How you can go from being sifted to eventually being lifted. And we use the man called Peter as our profile. And I said initially, I said Peter was a man like many of us. Peter was, was, a, was from a background that was not very... Uh, erud he was not very erudite. He didn't have a lot of pedigree. He was a man who was not accomplished in academics or wealth, but he was an average man. But Peter became the leader of the New Testament church because Jesus saw something in Peter that other people didn't. When Jesus was on the earth and he said, who do men say I am in Matthew 16? The Bible says Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, Peter, but my Father who is in heaven. And then the next thing we hear, Jesus told Peter, I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom. And that whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Peter became the leader of the New Testament church. That's why when Jesus came back from the dead in John chapter 21, the Bible says, Jesus asked Peter, lovest thou me, lovest thou me, lovest thou me? And he said, feed my sheep. He didn't tell John to feed his sheep. He didn't tell James to feed his sheep. He said, Peter, the word feed there means protect, preserve, keep an eye, give them food, nutrition. nutrition. Peter was given a commitment to lead the church. There was a reason why Jesus chose Peter. And I, I talked about this over the last few weeks. I said, number one, Peter was sent by God. Peter had a 
calling. Peter was, the Bible says, no man takes this honor upon himself. Number two, Peter was sober. First Peter chapter two, I believe Peter was talking to the church. He says, I've learned one thing, not to be flippant, but to be sober. Number three, Peter was sincere. Peter was a man who wore his hat on his sleeve. He said what he meant and he meant what he said. Peter was a servant. When you read the last chapter of the, the last book of Peter, the second, chapter, the second book of Peter, Peter describes him as, a, as an apostle and a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. We talked about all this already. Peter was, he had to see himself as special. Peter had spent years being relegated to the background. They told Peter, are you not a fisherman? That he, they talked about Peter in the book of Acts. I said, they noticed that they had been with Jesus, but that they were not learned, that they were ordinary fishermen. But this is where I'm going today. Peter was surrendered. Amen. I believe that if you're going to be lifted in 2020 from the COVID epidemic, from the quagmire the world is going through, from the confusion, from the fiasco, from the rat race, from the just the, 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 the shenanigans of our world, you need to come to a point in your life when you are fully surrendered. Somebody say surrendered. And I believe that's what's going to distinguish us in the last days. A surrendered church is going to be the shining church. Don't forget, I believe in the book of Ephesians 5 verse 25, the Bible says that Jesus is coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle. I don't know if you've seen a wedding dress without wrinkle. I mean, you've got to be gleaming, superb. The Bible says Jesus is not coming for a garbage church. He's coming for a glorious church. He's not coming for, he's not coming for a, a wrecked, wretched church. He's coming for a, a, a church without wrinkle. Am I talking to somebody? So this whole slipping and dipping and ripping and, and, and trying to put one leg in the world and one leg in the church is not what Jesus is coming for. You are most likely not going to be on the bride list when Jesus comes. Because the Bible says that this is the church is coming for. A glorious church. The word glorious means kabad. It has weight. It has influence. When you talk, people listen. When you open your mouth, demons tremble. A glorious church without spot or wrinkle. Am I talking to somebody? The challenge of our world is that we want to bind demons, but we don't want to surrender to God. You can't have it both ways. Let me show you a scripture from the book of Ephesians. I believe, sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Missionary Preston. Look at, this is the paradox of our generation. People who want to exhibit power, but they're not willing to surrender to the source of the power. You can't do it both ways. You can't eat your cake and have it. If you want to tell a devil to go, you better be willing to surrender to the God who has the power over the devil. I went to Nigeria on a missions trip and we, to Liberia, and we had a great time on the last day of the crusade. It started pouring. I mean, we had preached. Hundreds of Muslims had given their lives to Jesus. We had fed the people, given them clothes, given them medicine. The very last night of the crusade, we were leaving the night, the, 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 the next morning, the, the, the crusade was about to start. We had finished everything else. It was about 8, 9 p.m. And the rains were coming down. The rains were coming down. And, you know, people were, we had bought tents, but what would, it was a set up from the enemy to stop people from coming from their houses to the program. And I knew that in the spirit. I knew because after two days of ministry, I knew the witch doctors and the traditional worshippers and the Muslim clerics and the imams were upset at what we were doing and they were going to challenge us. So what did I do? I took my pulpit from under the canopy and I brought it out under the rain and I said, if I am a man of God, tonight I decree this rain to stop. Because it was pouring in that, in that Samuel town, Sierra Leone. It was pouring rain. And I said, if I'm a man of God, because the people were there wondering, is this caused by the witch? Because I think some of them had heard that the witch doctor was going to cause rain to fall that night. I said, that's not going to stand. So I stood under the rain. I could have preached under the canopy. But I said, if I'm a man of God, I decree that this rain will stop. 
before this sermon is over. I started preaching, it was raining. But about five minutes into my sermon, you can ask my wife, she was there, the rain had abated. The air was clear. What had happened? We had demonstrated our power over the spirit of witchcraft. And I'm here to tell somebody, there's witchcraft in, in Mississippi. Don't think I live in Western world, there's no witchcraft, there's no, there's no, all those things people do, the Ouija board, the Freemasonry, the Eastern Star, all those stuff are, are witchcraft in disguise. And if you get under a spell of them, you cannot break out if you are not anointed and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Look at what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 10 verse 6. The Bible says, 2 Corinthians 10 verse 6, it says, Having a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 6, Having a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. The Bible is saying here clearly, you cannot, you will not avenge the enemy until your obedience, not is partially complete, not is 99.9% .9 complete. The Bible says, having a readiness to revenge all disobedience. So when I stand before demons and devils on Holy Ghost night, like this Friday, and I take authority over the spirit of sodomy and lesbianism and witchcraft and, and satanic consequences and, and abortion, I don't, I don't come there in my own strength. No, I have covered myself with the blood of Jesus and I have made sure my obedience to God is fulfilled. Am I talking to somebody? So what I'm saying here today is that Peter had to come to a point where he's, he was surrendered to God because if he wasn't surrendered, he wouldn't be an instrument God could use to deliver the last day church from the spirit of the enemy. Don't forget, Peter was the one who was walking in, 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 the, in the acts of apostle and his shadow was healing the sick. But Peter didn't get there overnight. Am I talking to somebody? You see, people want to get there overnight. They want to heal the sick, raise the dead. No, no, no. You, it, it takes a broken life, a consecrated life, a yielded life, a life that has decided, I'm not going to do what everybody else is doing. The Bible says in the book of Psalm 103 that God made his ways known to Moses and his acts to the people of Israel. What happens is many of us are, are spectators. Some are participators. You cannot be a spectator and expect, you cannot be a person who is not surrendered and be a participator. Moses was in on God's actions because he had become surrendered. The Bible says that Moses was the meekest man on the surface of the earth. Am I talking to somebody? So what happened with, I'm just gonna give you an example of Moses and I'll go on with this. Moses was 120 years old in Deuteronomy 37 verse 4. And the Bible says, Brother Joe, his natural force was not abated. That means he could run, he could climb, his eyes were good, he didn't use glasses. He was as strong as he was 80 years ago. But then the Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 3, the Bible says that God told Moses, when Moses said, look, Lord, I can see the promised land. It's right there. Please let me go over this promise. Let me go over to this place. What I'm saying is this. Moses could walk across the Jordan to the promised land. Moses could have swam across the Jordan into the land of Canaan. Moses had the energy, the strength, the brilliance, the geography, the acumen, the, the necessary analytical science to cross the Jordan. But the Bible says, God said, don't speak of this to me about this anymore. He says, go up to the mountain, look at the promised land, and there, that. I'm trying to say something here. Why was Moses, out of 7 to 10 million people, the only one God revealed his ways to was because Moses was a broken, surrendered man, a meek man. The Bible says, even though he had the energy to cross the Jordan, he said, God doesn't want me to cross it. 
And I said, I made a statement here last week. I said, the, the, the secret to a life that is lifted is to understand this statement. The very powerful statement. I said, Jesus does not give us freedom to do what we want, but freedom to follow him. We are living in a generation where people want to do whatever they want. I, I'm, I'm free. I have liberty in Christ. But the Bible says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Romans 6 says, God forbid. Somebody say, God forbid. The liberty, the freedom that we are offered in Christ is to follow him, not to do whatever we want. I was a young man in my mid-20s. Maybe my late 20s, maybe my, I'll be about 28, 2003, I think, or 2001. I was traveling from Nigeria to Ghana, and I was on a flight to take an exam to come to the U.S. I had to pass this exam to become a doctor in the U.S., so there was no centers in Nigeria. I had to travel to Ghana. I wasn't married then. I think I was engaged to my wife, I believe, and... I was on this flight, and there was this young girl next to me, and she and I started talking, and I found out some things as we were talking. It was a, maybe an hour and a half flight. This girl was the daughter of, she was the daughter of the Senate president of the country in Nigeria, and she said she was going to Ghana to have some fun and you know, do some things. She was a university student, but she was obviously living a very wayward life. And she invited me to her hotel room as we were talking, as we were, I mean, she was sitting next to me, and, and she, she, after some time, I think, I, I, think, I, I, think I, I witnessed to her, and then she said, oh, I'm going to be at this hotel. You can come around and all that. And I, I was in Ghana for like maybe, maybe a week or six days or so. But do you know, it never crossed my mind to take her up on her invitation. Why? Because Jesus gives me freedom to follow him, not to do whatever I like. Why would I leave my country and go to another country and then out of all the people in that country, go to see a girl who is on a wayward mission in her hotel room? And then you will say the devil caused me to sleep with her. The devil is not the problem. You carried your legs and went there by yourself. Am I talking to somebody? Because half of the time, you see people say, oh, the devil made me do it. The devil was, you, you took yourself into harm's way. I'm trying to paint a picture for you today. Peter was called by God, anointed by God, but Peter had to break his self-will. He had to break his self-control. He had to break his self-control of his life so that God could use him. And many of us, until we let go and let God, we can never become people who are lifted to where God wants us to be. Do you remember when Peter was in the Garden of Gethsemane? In the book of John chapter 18, I believe. John chapter 18. And there was a young man called Malcolm. Malchus. And the Bible says, Peter threw, brought out his sword. And we are living in an age where people want to do the, 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 they want to do the will of God, but they want to do it with a sword. Am I talking to somebody? They want to burn and kill and, and, and shatter glass and they want the world to hear them. And I'm here to tell somebody, the world will not hear you because of your violence. The world will hear you because you do the will of God. In John 18, Peter pulled out his sword and he cut off the ear of Malchus. And Jesus told Peter, put up your sword back into your sheet. The cup which my father has given me. Shall I not drink it? And the Bible says Jesus put his hand on the ears of the servant and the, he, and the ear of Marcus was healed. But I'm going somewhere. Peter was not yet fully surrendered even at the point of Jesus' crucifixion. Peter still had issues. And Jesus said, Peter, I need you to 
give up your control. You're not going to win this fight by the sword. He said, he who, he who kills by the sword will also die by the sword. The Bible says that if you look around, those who, who die early, they live a fast and they shed blood. Am I talking to somebody? You can't live long if you've shed so much blood. When David was about to enter the promised land, God looked around and said, David, you've shed too much blood. I can't, I can't, I can't. So when, when he wanted to build the temple, he said, I can't let you build the temple. Where am I going? Peter, even though he was called, anointed, appointed, he needed to be broken. And when Jesus had died and resurrected in John 21, the Bible says Peter told his colleagues, he told Thomas, he told, he told James and John, he told Nathaniel, he says, I go fishing. I've given up on the ministry. This is too hard. This is too rough. I've got to, I, I can't see any hope anymore. I go fishing. And the Bible says, this same Peter who, when Jesus saw him the first time, and Jesus told him, cast your net, your nets with an S into the river. Jesus now showed up in John 21 and told Peter and James and John, cast your net to the other side. And this time, Peter did not argue. He simply cast his net. And the Bible says that they caught so much fish. And John said, it's the master. And Peter swam towards him. And Jesus asked him, are you ready to lead my sheep? Are you surrendered? He says, Peter, lovest thou me? That means, do you agape me? You see, surrender is agape. Surrender means I have nothing in me that is of my own. I have yielded totally to the Lord. And Peter said, I feel you. you. Then Jesus asked him again, do you agape me? Peter said, I feel you. Then Jesus said, do you feel you me? Then Peter made a statement. He says, Lord, thou knowest all things. Someone said, thou knowest all things. I think the greatest challenge in the world is for people to understand that God knows everything. You see, all this, your hiding stuff is useless because God knows everything. I, I, I laugh at people who want to cheat on their wives and steal public funds or church funds or people who want to, you know, live a wayward life and get away with it. God knows all things. The reason why people are not surrendered is because they still think they can hide things from God. The Bible says that all things are open and they are naked unto him whom we have to do. If you know God knows all things, you won't be hiding stuff from him. Am I talking to somebody? I was reading a few chapters of the Bible yesterday and I was shocked. In Acts chapter 9, Brother Joe, the Bible says a man who had been killing Christians called Saul of Tarsus suddenly saw a light on the road to Damascus. And I'm going somewhere with this because I want to show you what happens when you surrender totally. It doesn't take time. It takes truth. Saul was killing people one minute. He was burning churches the next minute. Then he saw the light shining brighter than the noonday sun. And he heard a voice and said, Paul, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And Saul said, who art thou? And he says, I am Jesus. He said, it is hard for you to kick against the pricks. And Saul said, Lord, what will thou have me do? And I'm here to, you see, and then the Bible says that Saul became blind and he was blind for three days. And after those three days, God sent a man called Ananias. He says, go to that place, Acts chapter 9, from verse 10 to 19. Go to a, 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 a street called Straight, and you'll find a man called Paul, Saul, praying, for he has seen a vision that you should come and lay hands on him. What am I trying to say here? Saul was a killer. Within 24 hours, he was asking the Lord, what will thou have me do? You can read it in Acts chapter 9. And that one prayer made Saul see in, in 72 hours, catch this, in 72 hours he became a prayer warrior. He became a prophet. He saw Ananias laying hands on him. 
He became a... a he, he, what will happen to your life if you fully surrendered cannot be quantified. Because in 24 hours, Saul became a more valuable agent for the kingdom of God than for millions of, of people in Jerusalem who were arguing about the bread and the, they were giving my bread to the Grecian widows. Paul was like, Lord, what will thou have me do? And that, I believe, is the most powerful prayer. Every morning when I wake up in the morning, that's the prayer I pray. Lord, what will thou have me do? Because your life is not measured by its duration, but by its direction. Am I talking to somebody? Your life is not a measure of its duration, but by its direction. Jesus lived 33 years, but he lived a life of direction. At 12, he was in the temple, talking with the people in the temple about the word of God. At 30, he launched his ministry. At 33 and a half, he died on the cross. But till today, until tomorrow, until eternity comes, worldwide, his name will never be forgotten. 33 and a half years but his life had direction. Somebody say direction. Because there are many people who have duration, but they have no direction. 70 years, still smoking and chasing girls and dipping and snuffing and using marijuana and cocaine and and, and, and you think your, your life has no impact because of its duration. Your life has impact because of its direction. If there's one thing I want to get into your head today is you have no right to direct your life. The Bible says in the book of Romans chapter 8 verse 11, the Bible says that if the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead dwells in our mortal bodies, that same spirit will quicken our mortal bodies. And the Bible goes on to say in Romans chapter 8 verse 12, I believe, and 13 and 14, going as a continuation, it says that it will quicken our mortal bodies. And it says, therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. Because if you live after the flesh, you will die. But if you, through the spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. You have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby you cry, Abba, Father. Until you are yielded to the Holy Spirit, you cannot be led by the Holy Spirit. The Bible says here that the Spirit of God will quicken our mortal bodies when we do not live after the flesh, but rather we mortify the deeds of the flesh and we are then led by the Spirit of God. Many of us want to be led by the Spirit of God, but we have not surrendered totally. The Holy Spirit is a gentleman. He's not going to force you. You've got to say, Lord, I, I, you have to pray that prayer that Paul prayed. What will thou have me do? And when he says, go to Botswana, get ready to go. When he says, marry that girl in your compound that you don't think looks good enough, that's who you should marry. When he says, quit that job, I'm going to the ministry, that's, where you should do, that's what you should do. I'm telling you, there's no better place in life than the will of God. What you think today looks good is a few years ago in 1999, Yahoo was the big deal. I don't know how many of you were born in 1999, but Yahoo was the only thing we knew in internet. So the people, who were, the people who owned Yahoo were approached by Google. They had just started, and Google said, ah, we can't make it. You guys are too big. Can you come and buy us, like, for $1 million and help us? Maybe we can merge with you and become a good organization. And the guys at Yahoo said, no way. You guys are just small fry. There's, there's nothing where you have to offer us. 20 years later, they sold Yahoo for less than $1 million. I mean, it was about one, 
the, I mean, it was less than, it was initially the value of Yahoo was in billions. By the time they sold Yahoo, they were talking in millions because nobody wanted Yahoo. I don't think any of the kids here have Yahoo accounts. Everybody has Gmail and other stuff. Because the people did not understand their season, their time. Everything has a season. Everything has a time. If you will surrender to what God is telling you to do per time, you will see your lift in manifest. Am I talking to somebody? If I had gone with that crazy girl on the flight and gone to her hotel, who knows what spirit she will have transferred that night. The spirit of the harlot. Do you know what the spirit of the harlot is? You don't have shame. You know how harlots stand on the corner of the road, Brother Joe? You will start doing things shamelessly. You'll be fighting with your wife in the streets. You'll be gambling with government money. You'll be drinking outside where people can see you because the spirit of the harlot is upon you. You have no shame. You steal with no cover. You, you cheat with no, um, with no, with no decorum. <laughs> Praise God. But God said in Micah chapter 2 verse 7, look at what God said. He says, do not my words do good. Somebody say do good. Do not my words do good to him that walketh uprightly. My challenge to you today is to walk uprightly. Walk on a straight path. It might be a narrow path, but walk uprightly because the Bible says in Micah 2 verse 7, my words will do you good. I haven't seen a man. The Bible says, I have been young, now I have been old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging for bread. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Azusa Street Revival, but it was a young man out of, the, out of Louisiana who went to California to start the Azusa Street Revival. He was a young man in his early 30s, and the Holy Spirit fell in, in Los Angeles. And he was, he was, people came from all over the world. Do you realize that within 10 years of Azusa Street, they had missionaries in almost 100, I think within 10 to 20 years, they had missionaries in total, after a period of time, in almost 100 countries. Because of Azusa Street, churches were started in Africa, in South America. But do you know what happened with Azusa Street? Somebody refused to surrender. Many people don't know this, but because the young man was a single man, he was a bachelor, the girl who used to lead the singing, he married her. And there was another woman who was the editor of the journal because they used to send out a journal every month to their partners in the 1915, 1910. This was before Assemblies of God. This was before Church, before Church of God in Christ. They were sending partner letters to 50,000 people every month. The woman who was editing the journal wanted to be his wife. Do you know what happened? When he married this girl who was the singer, the woman who was the editor took all the names of the 50,000 partners of the ministry who used to send them money, who they used to correspond with. She took all those names and she moved to Portland, Oregon. And she started writing her own newsletter and telling people to send the support they were sending to Los Angeles to Oregon in Portland. What happened? Somebody had not surrendered. She was doing the work of God, but she was not walking with God. Am I talking to somebody? This man went up to Portland, Oregon with his wife and said, please give me those names. Our ministry cannot continue. We are, we are depending on their support. We need those names. And that woman said, you jilted me. You made me hope to be your wife. And now you've married this girl. I'm never going to give you those names. She walked for God, W-O-R-K. But she did not walk with God, W-A-L-K. 
And the Bible says in James 3, verse 18, wherever there's strife and confusion, there's every evil work. Within five years, the ministry collapsed. The, 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 the people stopped coming. The miracles stopped happening. People divided the, the Azusa Street Fellowship. The whites went one way. Because this guy I'm talking about was an African-American black guy. I'm trying to remember his name now. Um, I can't remember his name now. But the, 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 the ministry divided. But it was on the platform of one woman who felt he should have married me. But the Bible says here in Romans chapter 8, he said that mortify the deeds of the flesh by the Spirit so that you can be led by the Spirit of God. I'm talking to people here who want to be led by the Spirit of God, who want to be lifted, who want to surrender. You've got to crucify the flesh. If that woman had said to herself, I may have, I may have, I may have been overlooked but I believe that my, my life is more than just a wedding ring. Am I talking to somebody? My ministry is more than just being a missus on this man's name. I have a calling from God on my own. One act destroyed the whole ministry. And God told me to tell somebody here, don't make that mistake of going in the wrong direction because one wrong direction can destroy a life of destiny forever. People make, a, they make jest of it. Oh, well, I'm going to do whatever I feel like doing. You can't take that gamble. You have to do what God has told you to do. Because one wrong move can jeopardize a lifetime. Is somebody getting what I'm talking about? I think Jesus said it. He said, the day, the, the, he said, the day, he says, while it is day, I think in John chapter 14 or so, it says that I shall walk while it is day, but the night cometh when no man can walk. You see, when you know God's will, God says do it. Don't try to do the will of God in the night because it's impossible. You will hit a shipwreck. Am I talking to somebody? So why, what happened to Peter? How did this man who took his sword and cut off the high priest's servant's ear become a man who at the, at the, date of the, the, day, the day of Pentecost stood up and said, all of you, hear the word of God. You have denied him and 3,000 people gave their lives to Jesus. I believe that between John I believe that between John chapter 18, when he cut off that disciple, the high priest's servant, and in John chapter 21, when he told Jesus, thou knowest all things, he had come to the point where he says, I surrender all. I don't have any hidden agenda. I don't have any hidden motive. I'm just at your, at your disposal, Lord. Use me in whatever direction you want to. I was called today to be a staff advisor for the Christian medical doctors, medical students in, the, in my university. I didn't lobby for it. I didn't ask for it. I didn't canvass for it. They just said, I want you to be the staff advisor. What happened? Somebody is watching you every time. Because for you to model, for you to be a staff advisor, they know you're not going to be the kind of person to take advantage of young people. What am I trying to say? Somebody is watching you. You've got to know there's no hidden, there's nothing hidden. What you are doing in the closet, the Bible says, Jesus said, it will be shouted from the rooftops. There's a story that really pains me, but, you know, I hope the young kids here don't get the wrong impression. But there was a church in Atlanta, Missionary Preston, you may know the church. This church had 10,000 members. The pastor was a white guy, and it was the first, the very first integrated church in the whole United States. This pastor was so popular, in the days of Martin Luther King, he will be walking with Martin Luther King, he will be walking and preaching against racism, but he was a Caucasian. In fact, his church, the Church of God, sent him away because of his affiliation with African Americans. And the African Americans loved him. In fact, most of his members were African American in downtown Atlanta. But do you know that at the age of 82, this man died broken. You can read it up. 
His name was Archbishop L. Park, P-A-L-U-K. They found out that all through his ministry, this was when he was about to die, people had, when he was in his 70s, late, early 70s, people had been speaking about his, 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 his lack of sexual fidelity to his wife. So members of the church began to report that he was doing this with the women, doing this with the women. But what really brought the case to national prominence, Missionary Preston, was they decided to check the paternity test of his brother's son. You'll catch it later. His brother's son was coming to the church. His brother's son was the assistant pastor to him. His brother's son was the heir apparent because he, the archbishop, had only three girls. So he had raised up this, his brother's son, to be the next thing. And after those women started talking about how he was molesting them, the FBI got involved and said, let's do a paternity test on everybody in the family. And they found out that this, his brother's son, that was given birth to by his brother's wife was actually the archbishop's son. <laughs> Praise God. I'm not telling you what is made up. It's, it's, it's all confirmed. And the brother had no idea. But this was happening. That boy we're talking about was like 42 years old when he found out that his real father was not his father, but the archbishop's... But the, his real father was not his, was not his father, who was the archbishop's younger brother, but the archbishop who had been sleeping with his sister-in-law. What happened? The ministry collapsed. The young man who was the heir apparent began to preach a different gospel. He still has a church. This young man who is now 40-something, but if you go to his church, they preach everything is okay. Islam, Jew, they say there's many ways to God. They believe that there's no hell. I'm just trying to paint a picture here. One man's lack of surrender has spiraled down and affected the next generation. One man's lack of brokenness, one man's decision not to stay in the straight and narrow has changed the trajectory of the following generations. Hear me, friends. God told me that he wants to strengthen you because the Bible says that in Isaiah 58 that you will, be the, you, will be, you will be the restorer of the breach. He says that you will, you will, you will, he says that you will lift up the, the, the foundations of many generations. Isaiah 58 from verse 12. How can you lift up when you yourself are weak? I believe that what God is going to do in your life is going to be a turning point for your generation. The man we call Colgate, William Colgate, was an ordinary guy, no money. He started giving God 10%, and God blessed him so much, he became a multi-billionaire. Today, Colgate is $15 billion, I think, in revenue, if not profits. They are in 120 countries. His great, 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 great grandchildren, 300 years later, are still enjoying called, being called Colgate. Why? Because one man said, I will surrender all. Somebody say surrender. I don't know what you're holding on to that might be limiting the blessing that God has for you. But God told me to tell somebody, it's not enough to just come to church. You need to come to Jesus. You need to surrender to Jesus. You need to tell Jesus, at thy word, Lord. At thy word, Lord. Whatever you ask of me, I will do. Do you realize that it took 40 years in the wilderness if for the Israelites to get out of the wilderness for a journey that was 11 days long? What you lack in life is direction. Because the Bible says that the pillar of cloud by day, the, the, the pillar of fire by night, the cloud by day. All you've got to do is ask the Lord, what will thou have me do? 
And I believe, Missionary President, that that's what happened to Peter. When Peter came to the point where he says, Thou knowest all things, he said, I'm done. I'm, I'm, I, I give up my own agenda. I give up everything. I'm not interested in my own paraphernalia of office. I'm not interested in what happens to me. Lord, whatever you want, I'm, you do whatever you want with my life. And don't forget, this was the same Peter who told them in the book of Luke chapter 18. He says, Lord, we have left all. Somebody say all. Out of everybody. Do you know Judas was there? Thomas was there. Nathaniel, Andrew, Matthew. But Peter opened his mouth and says, I don't know about Judas. He might be stealing from the pot, but I can say, I have left all. I have left all. I have left all and followed thee. And Jesus said, no man who has left father or mother, houses or lands, shall he says, in this world, you shall have a hundredfold. So what's a hundredfold? And in the world to come, eternal life with persecution. Many of you don't know that you have a hundredfold in your future. If you will surrender, money will start looking for you, not you looking for money. Is somebody getting what I'm talking about? You're not living by the budget of this world. You're living by the income of heaven. Financial favors, people will send you money who have never known you in your life. Is somebody get what I'm talking about? That's what happens when a man is surrendered. I wrote here, I said, the shortest road to failure is trying to please everybody. The shortest road to failure is trying to please everybody. Peter said, Jesus. Thou knowest all things. I'm, I've been trying to make myself famous. I'm done. I've been trying to be the biggest, get the biggest boat and get the biggest anointing and get the biggest, you know, seats at the gates of Jerusalem, but I'm done. Thou knowest all things. You know my heart. You know my motive. You know my mind. Thou knowest all things. If you can come to God with that total surrender, Lord, you know me in and out. I'm not trying to cover up anything. You know my heart. You know where I'm coming from. You know where I'm going. God said, that's when I believe you'll be ready. Too many Christians are living a camouflage Christianity. They, they live a, 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 a confused life. Sunday in church, Monday on the streets. Their life is duplication and duplicity and, 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 and what we call it in medicine is diplopia. If you are driving with diplopia, double vision, you're going to hit, you're going to make a wreck somewhere because you're not focused on one thing. The Bible says looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Is somebody getting what I'm talking about? The last thing I'm going to share with us before we pray is Amos chapter 3 verse 3. I'm going to leave this with you. The Bible says, can two walk together except they be agreed? Many of us want to impose our agenda on God. God says, you cannot walk with me if you don't agree with me. That means that it's not my will be done, but it's God's will being done. The Bible says, how can two go together except they be agreed. Jesus, the Son of God, said, whatsoever I see the Father do, that's what I say. Do whatever I see the Father say, that's what I say. Even the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit came down to the earth, it was the same thing. The Bible says, only what the Holy Spirit hears will he say. John 16, the Bible says, the Spirit of truth, he will guide you into all truth. Why? Because he will not speak of himself. So I say he will not speak of himself. Whatsoever he hears, that shall he speak and will show unto you. He will glorify me. Catch this. The same Holy Spirit that guides you into all truth does not take his own initiative by himself. He waits for God's instruction. And that's why he glorifies God. Hear me and hear me well. If you want to glorify God, if you want to be led by the Spirit, then you've got to first of all say, 
not my will, Lord, but thy will be done. I don't depend on what I hear from the media, from social media, from the public media. I depend on what God tells me to do. Is somebody hearing what I'm talking about? A woman called Kori Temboom. She was taken to what they call the Holocaust in the Second World War. They killed her father. They killed her mother. They took her sister. They killed her brother also. And her and her sister survived the Holocaust. I heard, I'm sure you've heard of Auschwitz. 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 That's where the greatest Holocaust happened in Poland. And one day after the Holocaust, she was so depressed. She had lost her family except her sister. No, her sister died as well. Her sister died as well just before the end of the Holocaust. And she saw the man who had killed her sister, the German soldier who had beat her sister because they were in the same camp. So she knew this man. So she had left Poland. She had gone back to, she had traveled America and she was going all over the world talking about her experience with the Holocaust. And one day when she was speaking in somewhere in Europe, this man who had almost, he beat her sister so bad that her sister eventually died this man walked into the room in the 1940s. And this woman, Corrie Ten Boom, she had been preaching forgiveness because she's a Christian. She had been preaching love, unconditional love. Those who hated you, those who killed you, forgive them. And she said when she saw that man, everything that was hurting in her just came out. And she was numb with, with anger and pain. But she heard the voice of the Lord say, there's no pit so deep that the love of God is not deeper still. She heard the voice of God say, there's no pit so deep that the love of God is not deeper still. God said, go up and hug that man. Tell him who you are and tell him you forgive him. Tell him you love him with the love of God. And she went and she, she broke. She said that day was the day she learned forgiveness. She held that man's hand. She told him, I forgive you. The man had now become a Christian. And he also said, I'm sorry. And they cried and cried and cried. Corrie Temboon lived till she was like 97 years old. Published a book they did a movie on her. She became a popular person. She lived in America, in California, and she became a multi-millionaire from her books and her movies. But you know what I think, Brother Joe? If she had not forgiven that man, her destiny may never have been lifted. If she had held on to that bitterness in 1949 or 1947, she may never have become the woman that we all celebrate today. Her generation celebrates her because she surrendered to the will of God. Will your generation say he was lifted? He was a strengthener. You cannot do it until you surrender. I want us to say some prayers tonight. I'm going to ask the Lord. That prayer that Paul prayed in the book of Acts chapter 9. Just eight words. What will thou have me do? Six words. I want you to pray that. I want to challenge you today. Whatever God tells you to do, do it. I want you to ask the Lord, what will thou have me to do? I want you to pray that prayer with your whole heart. Open your mouth right now and ask the Lord, what will thou have me to do? What will thou have me to do? What will thou have me to do? Ask the Lord. He will speak to you. I promise you. He will speak to you. What will thou have me to do, O oh Lord? Open your mouth and ask the Lord tonight. What will thou have me to do? You are not a biological accident. You are not a child of misfortune. You are a child of destiny. God didn't make you by mistake. He made you for a purpose. Ask him tonight. What will thou have me to do? to do on the earth.
I'm not here to just make up the numbers. I'm here to change generations. Ask the Lord tonight, what will thou have me to do, O Lord? What will thou have me to do, O Lord? What will thou have me to do, O Lord? Makababo shakatarabaya sukareboka. Lekobo shikarabado sakariarabaoka. Regarabo sakaranadaboka. What will thou have me to do, O Lord? Many of you, God is speaking to you about your future. God is speaking to you about your destiny. Where you are right now is the least you will ever be in life. You can go from glory to glory. You can go from faith to faith. You can go from strength to strength. COVID doesn't have to be the end of your life. I'm asking you to surrender. The reason why I share this story is because in John chapter 21, when Jesus told Peter, when Peter told Jesus, thou knowest all things, Jesus told Peter, he says, Peter, when you are old, he says, when you were young, you girded yourself. That means you dressed yourself. He said, Peter, John 21, you walked wherever you wanted to go. But Peter, I have seen a vision. When you are old, they will stretch forth your hands and another shall gird you and carry you where you would not go. Jesus told Peter, the future is bright because I see you surrendered. When you were young, you did your own thing, but I see you going into places you normally wouldn't even want to go. Do you remember Peter went to the house of Cornelius, the Gentile? He didn't want to go there. Peter went to the, the Gentile church, hang out with Gentiles. He didn't want to go there because he was a Jew. But when the Holy Spirit directs you, you go where others don't want to go. You are not moved by popularity. You are moved by perception. Holy Spirit, what do you want me to do? I believe Peter's life was changed because he said, Lord, thou knowest all things. You're going to tell the Lord tonight, Thou knowest all things. Search my heart, Lord. You know my heart, Lord. Thou knowest all things, Lord. Search my heart. See if there be any secret sin. Ask the Lord tonight. Because the worst kind of deception is self-deception. The Bible says a man who hears the word and does not do it is like a man who stands from a mirror and he goes away. He deceives himself. The worst kind of deception is self-deception. The Bible says, let him that thinketh his standard take heed lest he fall. Friends, ask the Lord tonight. Say, Lord, thou knowest all things. Am I? The Bible says, set yourself to see if you still be in the faith. Ask the Lord, Lord, search me, Lord. Check my heart. Am I still hungry for righteousness? Am I still thirsty for truth? Or have I been soaked up by the cares of the world, the pride of life, the cares of the eyes, the lust of the flesh? Ask the Lord tonight, Lord, just tell the Lord, Thou knowest all things, Lord. Lord, my life is like an open book before you. I surrender all to you tonight. Let's sing that song tonight. I surrender all. I surrender all. I surrender all. all. A friend, a doctor was asking me to get on the board of the Mississippi Family Physician Association. Why? I didn't ask for it. I didn't beg for it. I didn't lobby for it. 
They said, we want you to be on the board of the Mississippi Academy of Family Physicians. What's going on? Surrender. 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 Not my will, Lord, but your will be done. Father, I've shared your word. Lord, you said it's that those who hear your word and they do it, that they shall be blessed in all their deeds. You said that shall your word not good do good to those who bring it to pass. Lord, tonight I ask, oh God, that the hearers will not just be hearers alone, but also doers in the name of Jesus. I pray that this word will not just convict, but it will convince and it will change the lives of the hearers in the name of Jesus. We thank you for this church miracle temple we surrender this church to you oh god not our will lord but your will be done whatever you will to do with this ministry in this community we surrender this ministry unto you help us to become lifters of our generation restorers of the bridge change agents in our community we give you all the praise, Lord. We give you all the glory. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you so much for joining us for our Bible study. We're going to continue on this theme from sifted to lifted next week. The last one is strengthened. And I'm going to be sharing on that in the coming weeks. It's going to be powerful. I believe God is going to turn your life around. But like I said... Your future is bright, but you need to stay on track. Don't get trapped, don't get sidetracked or distracted. Where you're going is a glorious place. It's too good to be deceived by the devil. Stay on track, stay on focus. And I can assure you, the God of heaven will remember you. So join us. We'll be here Sunday, 9.30 a.m., here live, 10 o'clock, I believe, on Facebook Live. But if you can't join us in person, we'll do social distancing and all the hand sanitizer rules. I will be sharing a word from the Lord. I believe I'll be sharing a word from the Lord. Beware of frenemies. I'm sharing it today just so you get ready. Beware of frenemies. It's a new word. I just brought it out from the dictionary. It's going to be in the dictionary soon, but it's called frenemies. And God is going to be speaking, and I believe God is going to be delivering and healing and saving. Join us, 9.30, Miracle Temple Evangelical Church, Church of God in Christ, 418 Lakeshore Road, Jackson, Mississippi. It's a pleasure. God bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, okay. Was that the first time?